Amen. How we doing, Legacy Church? That sounds beautiful. Hey, here's the deal. So I found it kind of ironic that our topic of the day is communion, and because I got sick and our sermon series got delayed, I'm preaching a message on communion, which is about God's people coming together with God and one another on the two weeks that are National Christian Vacation Day. So half the church is out of town, and the other half of the church right now is more disturbingly down with COVID. So we're teaching on communion in a day and really an age where it's difficult to get the church together. And honestly, this season, really the last two years of pandemic have been some of the most challenging to my life because I grew up in the years of church when we didn't have to worry about things like coming together and getting sick. Anybody else remember those days? Some of you don't. You've actually forgotten your hand didn't go up. That's pretty funny. You're like, I do not remember anything BP before the pandemic. It's a wild time. But in all seriousness, sometimes communion is represented spiritually and not physically. And I know we have a lot of people online right now. And they need our prayers. Because there's some people in our church who have got COVID and It's not the kind that just feels kind of like the common cold. I hope that that's the kind most of us end up getting. But it can be a very serious thing, especially when you've got underlying health conditions. So together, can we commune with those who can't be with us? And can we extend a word of prayer for them? Can we do that? Let's pray for them. And especially if you know somebody from the church who's down and sick, why don't you pray for them by name right where you're at? Lord Jesus, we thank you for this day to commune with you. And God... We mourn for those who aren't able to be with us. Jesus, this virus is unlike anything I've ever seen in my life, and I think all of us can probably say that. And God, for those who have caught it and are down sick right now, Lord, especially those who have underlying health conditions and are at a higher risk, God, we ask that you would be the great physician, and Lord, that you would touch their bodies, that you would heal them. We pray that you would touch their minds, Lord, and that you would would, uh, ease their anxiety, Lord, in every trouble. Jesus, we pray that you would be with their families and that you would protect them. And God, I pray that we would mobilize as a church and take care of those in need. God, we thank you that, Lord, even in the midst of a pandemic and worldwide change, at Legacy Church, we've seen all kinds of new life. We celebrate the kids' camp that we just had, where over 150 kids throughout the week were on our campus. We thank you for the summer festival, God, where hundreds of people were touched. God, we thank you for the youth all-nighter that we just had, Lord, the youth leaders who actually are still alive after staying up all night. Jesus, we thank you for the things that are going on in this church. And God, we ask you to expand our reach. Lord, I ask you to miraculously end this pandemic that has separated the communion of the church. And Lord, we ask that you would join us now and that you would continue to do miracles in our lives. It is in the name of the great communal God, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. We are returning to a series called The Sacramental Life, which is all about seeing the invisible God in the visible world. And like I said, we're going to talk about communion today. Some of you know what the action of communion is, and some of you don't. And either way, that is totally okay. But essentially, when you think of communion, here's what I want you to think about. Communion is seeing our relationship with God. That's really what communion is all about. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. If you have no idea what communion is, and if you've ever looked at a Christian and thought they were kind of crazy for having a relationship with a God they can't see, I want you to know that I'm kind of with you. I'm kind of with you. Most of you know that I walk to the church almost every day at some point. And you look at me and you know that I have really long hair right now. And if you've ever seen me walking to the church, it looks like I'm talking to myself. And sometimes I walk to the church right after I've gotten out of the shower and I don't really look put together and I'm talking to myself and I'm kind of tired, especially now because I'm still recovering from the COVID fatigue. And you put that all together and your pastor kind of looks like a homeless person wandering the streets of Downey muttering to himself. It looks kind of crazy. I'm not muttering to myself. 
I'm talking to God. But have you as a Christian, if you're a Christian, have you ever felt kind of crazy? In the middle of a prayer, have you ever just thought, if somebody else looks at me right now, they're literally going to think I'm talking to myself like a crazy person. How can we see a relationship with somebody we can't see? It's all about communion. And here's why this is important. If you don't commune with God, you don't know the communal God. If you don't commune with God. For the young people, I'm not talking about your parents. If you were raised in the church, I'm not talking about something that was established based on something you did in the church a long time ago. I'm specifically talking about you. If you don't commune with the communal God, you don't know him. Here's what communion is. Communion is a word describing what it looks like to share a relationship with another person. It's an intimate relationship. It's coming together, not just on Christmas, not just on Easter, not just when there's other people around so that you can kind of go with the flow of whatever's happening. Communion is about having a real relationship that you pursue all the time. We should continually look like crazy people based on how much it looks like we're talking to ourselves when we are seeking a relationship with God. I want to tell you about a beautiful experience I had. Because here's the reality. If you already know what communion is in the church, especially if you come to Legacy, we take communion every week. We go to the back and there's a goblet set up on a table and we have crackers and sometimes, like today, these crackers are more like styrofoam because they're packaged in the COVID communion cup. You know what I'm talking about. They're back for today for your safety, and I deeply apologize. They're terrible, but it's about what it represents, not about the styrofoam that it actually is. Amen? Can we get through it one more time for safety's sake? Yeah. Here's the deal. A lot of people take communion in the church. And sometimes when you do things over and over and over again, it loses its meaning. Has that ever happened to anybody? If you go and you get to see, say, a concert for your favorite musician, the first time you get to go see him, it's like one of the biggest moments of your life. And then imagine if you got to go see that musician again the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and every day, and it's your job. And then you don't want a sound check. And you don't care that there's famous people. And you really learn how they are. Well, this is actually a friend of mine who lives across the street from Whitney's parents. I know the long hair proves something to you. This is when it matters, all right? It enables me to hang out with a certain crowd. I know the backup drummer for the band Kiss, all right? Now, nobody cares, apparently, because you're all holy people. I saw one. There you go. Somebody's like, I don't know if we're allowed to talk about Kiss in church. If you don't get excited, next week I'm putting on Kiss makeup and I'll bring the backup drummer to come and play drums for Legacy Church, all right? But here's the deal. As I was talking to my friend, he was telling me, he's like, oh yeah, you know, next week I'm, because uh, now he's a sound technician, he's like, I'm doing the music for ZZ Top. Anybody remember ZZ Top? Where's my bearded brothers at? Yeah, they're the guys that have the beards down to the middle of their stomach and they really have a great concert. He's like, then it's like, you know, Aerosmith. And he's talking about all these people that he gets to hang out with all the time. And I'm just like gushing because of how cool this is. And he's like, yeah, just a normal work day. That's how a lot of Christians approach two things. First, that's how we approach church. Because for those of us who kind of take being here seriously, you can start to feel like it's oversaturated. And then for those of us who take communion weekly like we do at Legacy Church, eventually, because you've oversaturated yourself so much with Jesus, Jesus starts to lose meaning. And even something like communion, which enables us to see a visible relationship with the visible God, the invisible God, excuse me, something like communion ends up becoming meaningless to us. So let me tell you about the most beautiful communion experience I had. Several years ago now, I took a group of high schoolers to Heartland Christian Camp, which nobody knows where Heartland Christian Camp is because it's Hume Lake's little sister. But if you've ever been to Hume Lake, you will understand this area. It's up in the Sequoia Mountains. It's beautiful. I took a group of teenagers, 
who were figuring out Jesus and were very teenage-like. They were rebellious, and they were more interested in the opposite sex than they were Jesus at camp. Red and blue, I was having to keep red and blue away from each other because when red and blue comes together, it creates purple. And a lot of the camp was spent trying to keep the kids out of the wrong cabin. You know what I'm talking about? So it was that kind of camp experience. And on the last day, there's this opportunity where teenagers are given an opportunity to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. And this night is marked by worship. And if you can put yourself in this environment, imagine being outside of Downey in the mountains where there's actually trees. And if you look up in the sky, you don't just see haze. You can see stars. And you can see them really vibrantly. And take yourself out into this field surrounded by pine trees and you look up and you can see the stars and you can see the Milky Way's colors. And in the middle of this big field, there's this bonfire. And then there's this worship leader who's like a good looking dude in skinny jeans for some reason. And he comes out and he's leading worship. And something starts to feel different than a normal experience you might have had. And there's a little small opportunity for me to talk to a bunch of teenagers about Jesus and the meaning of communion, which we'll get to in a second. But a lot of us take communion, and we don't even really think about what we're doing. And on this miraculous night that I'm telling you about, I want you to know that a large group of teenagers seemed to understand what was happening. See, when we take communion with God, it's all about seeing a visible relationship with an invisible God of forgiveness. And this moment of communion was marked by a group of teenagers doing several things. The most beautiful was their understanding that we can't commune with God if there is sin in our lives. That's not something that I was really teaching them. That's something that God was showing them. Now here's what a relationship with God is all about. God is the God of forgiveness. If you don't know this, we are separated from God by our sin. We need forgiveness in order to be able to have a relationship with a perfect God because we are imperfect. And on this night where we were getting ready to take communion, our teenager said, Pastor Shane, we cannot take communion yet because we need to seek forgiveness from God. And for 10 minutes, we prayed, and these teenagers were confessing sin because they so desperately wanted to be close to Jesus, and they understood that sin separates them from God. And then, something I never thought I would see in my life, and I might not ever see in my life again, happened. Teenagers started going to one another, and they started asking for forgiveness for the offenses, the wrong things that they had committed against one another. They were asking for forgiveness for things like gossip, slander, things that are common to teenagers, but really all of us. And I even had teenagers come up to me and ask for forgiveness from me as their pastor for several different reasons. And this was going on for over an hour. Can you imagine this worship experience really led by teenagers? I didn't have to do anything. There were some atheists in our group on this night, and they were seeing what was happening they were seeing these Christians actually taking seriously their communal relationship with God. And some of these atheists actually ended up receiving Jesus because they said, something is happening here tonight, and I want a relationship with the God that's making it happen. And then we took communion, and we walked away, and there was a real change in our church youth group. And some of these teenagers going on 10 years later, are now leaders in the church and missionaries and working on being pastors. And the youth group has exploded in numerical and spiritual growth. If you don't commune with the communal God, you don't know God. You know, it's really possible to come to church and to not experience anything with God. It's very possible. And for some of us, we might come to church and say, well, if I didn't experience God, then that must be God's fault. Or it must be the church's fault. And for some of you, you might feel distant from God right now. Has anybody felt distant from God in the last couple of years? 
I've talked to some very prominent leaders and important people in my life, and what they've said over the last two years is that it almost feels like God has removed the Holy Spirit in such a way that he's handing the world over to darkness, and it seems like the influence of God's people is quickly diminishing. Sometimes it feels like you can't feel God's presence. I want you to know that at if that's you, and when that's you, because it does happen in the life of every Christian, God has not abandoned you, he has not forgotten you, and he's never been closer to you. Because the distance between you and God never changes, but sometimes our perception does. God will never leave you or forsake you. If you're missing him, there can be all kinds of reasons for that. Or sometimes God allows us to feel distant from him for our own opportunity of growth. But God will never leave you or forsake you. But in those moments where we come to church and we don't feel like we're experiencing God or we feel like we're distanced from God, really I think that what we need to be asking is how can we lead communion with God? What do we need to do in order to pursue this relationship. Husbands and wives, if you feel distant from one another, here's my greatest encouragement. Don't just wait for something to happen. You be the one to initiate the closure of the distance. If you feel distant from your kids, you be the one to initiate closure of the distance. If you feel distance from your God, you be the one to pursue closure of the distance. It's all about doing the things Jesus has commanded us to do so that we can see a visible relationship with the invisible God. So what exactly is communion? Communion is an ordinance also called a sacrament by the Catholic and Orthodox churches that displays a visible relationship with the invisible God. Communion is a symbolic action reminding Christians of our salvation through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. So if you are a Christian, communion is commanded to you, and by the early church's standard, it's something that should be done every time you come together as the church. The early church, they were meeting together daily. Some of you are like, I can't sit through one of Pastor Shane's full long sermons once a week, so I'm going to come every other week or whatever. The early church came together every day for like three, four, five, six hours. So we're going to do that too. No, I'm just kidding. But they came together once a day, and they would take communion together. Why? Because they were so excited about the work of Jesus. They were reminding themselves of the new life they had in Jesus. So it's a symbolic action. But if you have spent any amount of time in the world of Christianity, maybe you've been told differently that it's not a symbolic action. Because Catholic and Orthodox churches actually teach that when you take the bread or cracker into yourself, that this cracker actually becomes the body of Jesus. And maybe you've heard that when you dip the bread or cracker into juice or for them wine, some of you are like, ooh, are we going to have wine in the church? I'm not even going to answer the question. But when you dip the bread or cracker into the whatever substance represents the blood of Jesus, that when you take that into yourself, that it becomes the literal blood of Jesus. Has anybody ever heard that? Well, let's explain where that comes from. Are you interested in knowing where that comes from? Because I think it's important to understand. Otherwise, we're not really going to have a good testimony of why we do things the way we do things. And maybe if we don't do things the way Jesus told us to do things, we might completely miss communion with the real God. Does that sound important? Look, communion is not transubstantial. Say that with me. Transubstantial. Transubstantial, that word is talking about the bread and the juice becoming the literal body and blood of Jesus. I don't know about you, but I have a real problem with considering what it would be like to eat somebody or to drink their blood that is completely unappealing to me. Do we have any vampires in the church? Praise God. One day I'm going to ask that question and somebody's going to say yes. And it's going to be like, 
one of the most exciting ministry opportunities of my life. I will not talk to you alone if that is you. Where did this belief system come from? Well, look at John chapter 6, verses 53 to 58. There's confusion about what communion is because of something Jesus said. This is where the confusion comes from. Jesus said to this crowd, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, which is Jesus, and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread lives forever. Might you understand why some people are confused about the cracker or bread and the juice or wine? I can completely understand why there's confusion because Jesus himself in this moment was speaking to a large crowd and just told a bunch of people, if you want to follow me, if you want to be saved, if you want new life and real life and true life and spiritual life and eternal life, you've got to eat my body and drink my blood. Put yourself in the crowd that was watching Jesus speak at this moment. And how insane would you believe I am if I told you, if you want to follow Jesus, line up, you've got to eat my body and drink my blood. If that happened in 2022, you know what that's called? That's called a cult. Drinking the Kool-Aid is bad enough. We don't drink somebody's blood, amen? In this real moment, here's what happened. If you look a little bit further in this text, John chapter 6, in John 666, which I don't think is an accident, by the way, 666 representing Satan's number, the Antichrist's number, it says the crowd heard this, and a great number of them turned away from Jesus. That's how that story of communion goes. Jesus is teaching the gospel, how people can be saved. The crowd hears, and they hear it in such a way that they can't reconcile. We will not follow a man who says, you need to eat my body and drink my blood. But look, here's what Jesus was really saying. Communion is metaphorical. It's not literal. It's not a literal taking in of Jesus' body and blood. Here's what communion is. It's representing Jesus' life, death, and blood and his forgiving sacrifice. That's what communion is all about. If you read the Bible, you got to understand there's different literary styles in this book. Actually, the Bible isn't even one book. It's a collection of 66 different kinds of writings, books, letters, poems. And you've got to understand when you're reading the Bible, what style of literature that piece of the Bible was written in or what style of speaking the speaker is speaking in, just like Jesus here. Otherwise, you're going to become very confused. If you have TikTok, and young people and old people alike are all over TikTok right now, I dare you in the middle of the night when you're death scrolling, type in flat earth. And see how many Christians are out there who believe that the earth is flat based on some things the Bible says. Like the wind blows from the four corners of the earth. Oh, well, if there's corners, the earth must be flat. Or the earth sits on top of pillars. Oh, well, the Bible says that the earth sits on top of pillars. So the earth must be flat like a checkerboard. And it must be standing on top of just big pillars floating out in space. That's not meant to be taken literally. So when we think of communion, we have to understand... This is not a literal cannibalism. There are people who condemn scripture because Jesus said, if you want to follow me, you have to eat my body and drink my blood. And then scripture also condemns cannibalism. So they're saying Jesus was telling his people to be cannibals. So there's no possible way that we can follow Jesus because the Bible contradicts itself. 
That's not what's being said. Jesus is telling us how to have a relationship with the invisible God, how to see this relationship. Communion is a command and action of worship. This is where it was instituted. This is the Lord's Supper. And that's just another word for communion, by the way. There's different things that it's called by different churches. And all of them are appropriate as long as they're founded in Scripture. Luke chapter 22, verses 19 and 20, teaches us where it was instituted. Jesus said to his disciples, after taking the bread and after giving thanks, he broke this bread and gave it to them. And he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant of my blood. So what communion represents is a new promise from Jesus. If you've, ever read, if you've ever read the Bible, you might notice that it's divided into two sections. There's the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament is also appropriately called the Old Covenant, the Old Promise. And the New Testament is also called the New Covenant, the New Promise. Here's why this matters. If you've ever wondered how people were saved before Jesus, here's the answer for you. The Old Testament is really a book of God's law. And in order for somebody to be saved under the old promise, before Jesus, they essentially had to become a Jew. Now, here's why. Because the Jews were set aside as the people of God, and they were given a standard set of laws, a moral code, things that are called sin— they were told not to do, and things that display actions of worship, they were told to do. So in order to be saved in the Old Testament time period, you and I, if we were living then, would have necessarily become Jews. Now, the Old Testament is a historical story of how God brought the Messiah into the earth through Israel. And the Messiah is a word that means Savior. So the Old Testament is just like the prequel to the real story. Now when Jesus shows up, this new covenant that Jesus is talking about, he's saying you are no longer saved by the old covenant. If you want to be saved, to have an eternity in heaven, you no longer have to become a Jew. You no longer have to Follow the worship practices of Israel. Now you just have to know me. And the way you know me is if you believe in my life and death, representing his body that was broken, the shedding of his blood, representing him as a sacrifice that covers our sins, and the coming resurrection of Jesus that came after this event. That's what communion is all about. So when we take communion as a church, we are literally remembering the promise of Jesus. And this is good news. I'll be honest with you. I'm not sure that in American history, there has ever been a more devastating period of time for the global church than the last two years. I don't think there's ever been a more devastating time. I spent a lot of time talking to my friend Bruce. We've talked about what church was like before the pandemic and what church culture was like and how it's changed through the pandemic and what it's come to now. And what's happening is we're seeing a great falling away of people who call themselves Christians. There's this large deconstruction movement that you can also see on TikTok. Type in Christian deconstruction and exvangical, and you'll see a lot of people who are walking away from the church and trying to justify what they're doing, saying that they can have, this is important, Come to me. They're saying they can have a relationship with God without his church and without his word. I'll show you the problem of that in just a second. But we're seeing this great falling away. Every time I turn around, and maybe you've seen it too, but Christian artists that I've grown up with that I love and I've respected, every time I turn around, they're coming out and saying things like, you know, I'm still leading worship, but I don't really believe the Bible anymore. It breaks my heart, and it should break your heart too. You're seeing pastors who are being exposed for all kinds of heinous sin and their churches are falling apart. We live in a devastating period of time. Here's ultimately why this matters for us. A couple things. If you look at the Bible, 
God is always at work in devastating times. Can we get an amen for that? If you've got a hard time, I believe that there's hope in that hard time and that God's going to use that hard time for your benefit because every time we see a hard time come against the people of God, God has used that hard time to do good things. But then, the reason why at Legacy Church we take communion every week is because of what Jesus said here. He said, do this in remembrance of me and my new covenant. Let me share a real moment of my recent history with you, church. When I caught COVID, I was kind of shocked by how sick I was and how sick my wife was. I was shocked. It's been two and a half years, and I've gone just about everywhere known to man and failed to catch COVID until now, doing routine life. And I got sick to the point that I was having all kinds of weird symptoms. I was away from my church for two weeks. I completely lost my schedule. And even though it was only two weeks, I felt so separated from the people of God and even God himself because I couldn't even think straight. I honestly started feeling a little bit depressed. And here's what's amazing. When I finally got to come back with the people of God, I started to remember what it felt like to be in God's presence. Every week when we come together and we take communion, we are reminded of Jesus' promise. What is Jesus' promise? If you live by the body of Christ, and if you are forgiven by the blood of Christ. There is always hope in Christ. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And most important of all, even if you don't feel God in the world, you will see him in the life to come. And the life to come is much longer than the life we have. There is no greater news. Here's a hard truth. And I really want to make sure this is softened. I don't ever want to be accused, and I don't want our church to be accused of being heartless or non-understanding. But we have to speak truth. Here's truth. And this is especially for everybody online. And I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about those of you who are out sick right now, I'm talking about people who just refuse to ever physically join the church. Christians outside of communion are Christians living in sin. Now that's easy to uh, understand. It's easy to repeat. Christians outside of communion are Christians living in sin. But what does it really mean? Some people at home right now might be going to the fridge and finding an old Hawaiian roll and a Dr. Pepper and saying that they're going to take communion. That's not, that's not necessarily wrong, but it's not necessarily right either because here's the context of what communion is meant to be. Remember this camp experience that I had where I was with a bunch of teenagers and in this moment, this was our church and we were confessing sin and seeking unity with God Almighty and His church and there was this togetherness and we weren't isolated or alone like many of us have been for so long. And now we're living in a culture that says you can follow God, you can be a Christian, but you don't need church. Can I tell you that a Christian divorced from the body of Christ, and if you don't understand that language, a Christian divorced from the bride of Christ, and if you don't understand that language, a Christian divorced from the church is a Christian divorced from God. Why did the early church get together at the table? You can read about this in Acts chapter 2. I encourage you to do this. Maybe you'll find inspiration. Why did the early church come together every single day and take communion as the church? Because it's this communion, this physical act of worship that allows us to remember the hope we have in Jesus. If you aren't a part of the church community, you're missing God. I understand 
that this might not be controversial for those of you who are here today. And thank you, because many of you I see every week. But for those who are outside, my heart breaks. I don't know what else to say about this, but my heart breaks. When you're divorced from the body of Christ, and there's a lot of reasons not to go to a lot of churches. I understand that. I don't find myself enjoying most of the institutional church that's out in the, the world. I understand there's pain. But I understand even more intimately that as Christians, our job is to work through that pain, to find communion with one another so that we can see our communion with God. And as we worship together in a sacramental kind of way, in action, suddenly we're not alone anymore and we're reminded of why we live. This is good news. But look, there's also some bad news with communion. And communion should never be taken lightly. This is why it's so important that as we're doing communion as a church, over and over again, week by week, at the end of worship, especially if, if you're just distracted by the hardships of the world, and sometimes that's just natural in life. There's a lot more going out in there that's filling your mind than there's in here. It can be difficult to focus on God and what's going on, but you need to know this, that divided communion is certainly division from God. Now, here's what this means. Divided communion is division from God, and it comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 17 and 20. This is the Apostle Paul writing to Corinth which just happens to be one of the most messed up churches in history, second only to a church that used to exist in this town called First Baptist Church of Downey. It's amazing, the parallels. But this is what 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 17 to 20 say, and write them down and learn them and live by them. It says, but in following instructions, I do not commend you. So here's what Paul is saying. He's talking about communion, and he says, you're following instructions, but I'm not commending you because you're doing it wrong. You're following instructions, but you're following my instructions with the wrong attitude, the wrong mind, the wrong heart. Have you parents ever told your children to do something, and they do it, but it's done wrongly? Has that ever happened? Let me give you an illustration. Sometimes my son has been known to make messes around the house. Some of the moms are already smiling. You're like, oh, yeah, I know what that's like. And I've told Jesse, it's time to clean that mess. And it's, it's just amazing to me how the teenage years have already been compacted into a four-year-old. Okay, Dad, I'll clean up my mess. I'll go ahead and do that. By the way, I don't like you very much. And I'll throw this trash away in the trash can. And look, I obeyed. Now I get an ice cream. I'm like, Whitney, I don't even know what to do with this right now. And honest to God, you know what I do in those moments? I go, Jesus, I understand fully. Please forgive me from the sins of my youth. My son has inherited my bloodline. And I am being paid back fully. It doesn't fall far from the tree. And I kid you not, I have talked to both of my parents, my grandparents. I talked to my great grandparents if I could. And I'd apologize. Because at four years old, I'm starting to see what it must have been like with me at 14 years old. And I'm wondering if we can see in ourselves at 14, 24, 40, and 84 years old. What the Apostle Paul might be saying. Listen to how important this is. He says, I don't commend you for doing what I've instructed you to do. He says, for in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. He says, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. Can you imagine being a part of church, a specific church, that is condemned by Scripture for coming together? Can you imagine that? Can you imagine if Jesus himself came and said, hold up, everybody time out. It would be better for you not to meet together than 
for you to come together as you are now. I can see that you're with me. This is a real experience. This happened at Corinth, and it's happening at churches all around the nation, and it had been happening at First Baptist Church of Downey, and that's a part of the reason why we're legacy church now, because in God's church, well, actually, let's just word it like this. If a church is divided, it's not a church. It's something else. It's not recognized by God. I told you a minute ago, the church is called the body of Christ. What good is a body? And I say this tenderly in a way that I hope is not offensive to anybody. So I'll, I'll change it and I'll say it like this. Have any of you ever experienced some kind of injury and then your body doesn't work quite right? Everybody. Everybody. It's a real disappointment, right? And we need to be tender to that. But here's the real illustration. If the body of Christ, which is supposed to work together to do ministry, if that body is divided, that body can't function. Imagine, read 1 Corinthians 12 to see God's version of this. His is way more important than mine. But imagine if a leg says, you know what, I'm just not going to listen to your brain and I'm not going to walk anymore. Or an arm says, you know what, I'm not going to hold anything anymore. And the mouth says, I'm just not going to speak anymore. Or even more ridiculous, the left hand says, I'm not going to work with the right hand. That sounds ridiculous, right? But that's what the Apostle Paul is saying, or if we use this language of the bride of Christ. Marriages don't work very well when the family's divided. And if you're wondering how to heal your marriage, you need to find unity in Jesus. And that's a different series, a different sermon. But as the church, here's what the Apostle Paul is saying. If you come together as a church and you're taking communion, even weekly, if there's division in the church, it's not a church. It's not even recognized by God. And there is no worship received by God. And for some of you, I hope that this is illuminating. For some of you who were raised in the culture of Downey, and I'm going to be honest, it's not just the culture of Downey, it's the culture of Los Angeles County. If you want to look at the world around us, Los Angeles County is the culture that is most rapidly progressing the culture of the Antichrist in America. We do not live in a good culture. We do not live in a culture that is godly. We do not live in a place that represents what God calls good, right, and true, and holy. We don't. In fact, we live in a culture that looks so much like what the Antichrist desires, it's scary. And it's impacted every church in our city, and I believe our county, and some of us personally. I just love sharing my heart with you. So many of you ask, how can you pray for me? Here's how you can pray for me. Pray for me to withstand a culture that loves division. Can you do that for me, please? Will you pray for me? Will you do that for me? And I'm doing it for you. And even more important than praying, will you take action? Please. Because our culture, for whatever reason, it's just... It's, it's even blind to what division looks like. They don't even see it. You don't see it because you've been raised in it. You're like, how can I not see this? Have, have any of you lived in a house long enough that if you look at the pictures from like 20 years ago and look at the pictures to today, you go, wow, the house colors faded so much and I didn't even know. When you live in an environment, you become blind to the sin in that environment. And it's a good thing that God is a God who heals the blind because we all need amazing grace so that we can have sight. Here's what your church needs to look like. And at Legacy, I know that we always have visitors from all around the world. So this isn't just one church. This is what every church is supposed to look like. How does God define a communal church that is not divided, that is approved to take communion together? Number one, Jesus is king. If you go to a church and Jesus is not identified as king, and if that word is divided from God, let's just make it really simple. If Jesus is not identified as God, it's not a church. Go read Colossians 1.8. Jesus has to be God. I, I've been ministering to our community 
You know, we have all kinds of stuff happening in the world of politics, and it really exposes what people believe. And there's a lot of people who say things like this. Well, I think and I feel. And there's Christians who are saying, I think and I feel. And as I'm ministering to people, as I'm trying to lead people to Christ so they don't go to hell, I want everybody in heaven with me. I like lots of people being around. What about you? The introverts are like, no, I want heaven to be empty. <laughs> no, no, no. I know we all want people to be in heaven with us. But here's what I'm seeing. There's a lot of Christians who are saying things right now, like I think and I feel, and it's the polar opposite from what God thinks and God feels. Well, pastor, how do you know what God thinks and what he feels? Well, go read the word of God that he wrote. It tells you everything that you need to know. There's no confusion. Everything we need to know about how God thinks and how God feels, we can find in what's called the Bible. Well, I don't know if I trust the Bible or not. Well, keep coming to church. You'll find that it doesn't matter if you trust it or not. Because your trust doesn't define if it's true or not. It's true. Jesus is king. If you want to know if Jesus is your God or not, next time you say, I think and I feel, ask yourself, well, does the way I think and I feel, does that align with how God thinks and feels? Uh-oh. People are like, how are you doing from COVID? I was 80%. Now I'm feeling a little bit of a Holy Spirit boost up to about 100%. Can we, can we take it up a little bit, church? Can we take it up a little bit, church? You with me, Abraham? On one hand, as a father, God intimately cares about how you think and feel. On the other hand, as God, at a certain point, Daddy says it doesn't matter what Daddy's children think or feel. We were at the beach yesterday, and Jesse thought that it was a good idea when it was time to go to keep falling into the sand after we'd already cleaned him up. So at a certain point, Daddy said, Jesse, I don't really care what you want to do anymore because Daddy wants to eat. If you feel something, it doesn't mean that it's from God. If you think that this isn't relevant to you, I, as your pastor, am telling you this is relevant to me. It's relevant to every single one of us. And I see so often, even coming out of our church, so many Facebook memes and Instagram stories and all kinds of things are being shared all the time. Frankly, from a lot of leaders who are heretics, and you're like, oh, well, that makes me feel good. That sounds really nice. Okay, does it make God feel good? Do we ever ask that question? Why don't we ask that? Probably because we're not communing with God enough to know his feelings. Church, sincerely, the number one tool of Antichrist is trying to convince you that your feelings will always lead you to God. If that's true, why does Jeremiah tell us that the heart is deceptive above all else? Your feelings don't dictate truth. If your feelings dictate your truth, you are saying you're God and God's not. Jesus has to be king of your church. And if you don't know what a king is, just say Jesus is the boss. Well, how can we know what the boss wants? Well, the Bible is the guidebook. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 through 17 tells you that. If you go to a church and the Bible is not your authority, you're at the wrong church. I don't know what else to tell you. And I'm not talking about going to a church with a pastor, like all these hipster people that I'm seeing right now, or pastors who are changing their position and they're opening the word of God and they're saying, oh, well, I know that it looks like this is called a sin, but that's not really what the Bible is saying. Or that's what God used to. To believe, no, no, no. The Bible says God never changes. He's really simple. The Bible's the guidebook. If you're at a church where the Bible is not your authority, you're not at a church, and you are not in a place where you should take communion. Next, look, we live in a culture that is so anti authority and anti hierarchy that it's almost impossible for churches to function in a way that's appropriate for communion. And I get it, I understand. Look at me for crying out loud. I still maintain some of my look from a former life. I rebelled against everything. Literally everything. 
If it looked institutional, if it looked hierarchical, I was rebelling just for the sake of it. I learned the error of my ways and how sinful that was. Hierarchy is good, is established by God. Even when we live in a world where the government is failing the American people, unlike any other time since the Great Depression, God says, honor your leaders because I put them there. Who are your leaders? Well, where are you at? Most of us have bosses. That's a leader that God has given you. For those of you who are in school, your teacher is a leader that God's given you. Whether they lead you toward God or not, God says it's a good thing to have a leader. In the church, this is what it looks like. The pastor or pastors oversee the word and church as prophets, judges, and shepherds. Like, well, what does that mean? Prophets? Are we going to be like Bruno from Encanto and telling the future? No. Well, here's what a prophet is. Oh, my gosh. Please. Stop following on your social media pages these crazy guys and girls calling themselves prophets. Stop it! I got a word from the Lord. Yeah, so did I. It's called the Bible. I got a word from the Lord. Send in $17.99 and I'm going to tell it to you, baby. Stop! For crying out loud, these are false teachers. It's rampant. It's everywhere. Knock it off. You're being led astray. Here's what a prophet is to the church. If God said it, it's my job to say it again and help you understand it. That's every pastor's job. That's what it means to be a prophet. Well, what does it mean to be a judge? You're like, well, I thought that we didn't judge. No, that's a false teacher who told you that. Go read the rest of Paul's writings in Corinthians. Paul actually says, no, you're supposed to judge each other's fruits. The church is supposed to judge each other's fruits, not in a way that's condemning, in a way that says, hey, you know what? We're called to help one another, and you, just, just like there's some rough edges in my life, there's some rough edges in your life, and when we get together and say, you know what, brother, sister, I love you so much, this in your life, it's not very Christ-like, and I believe that it's sin, I'm coming to you, because I don't want there to be any sin in your life. That's what it means to be a judge. Pastors in the church, it's our job to stand and to look at the church and go, this is of God and this is not of God. This will be allowed in God's church according to his word and the authority granted to the Bible, and this will not be allowed in God's church. That's what your pastors are supposed to do. And then they're supposed to be shepherds. There's a lot of people who are hurt. First in the church, my greatest wounds in life have not come from the world. You want to know what I've learned over 35 years of life? If somebody is going to hurt me, there's a 9 to 1 chance that they're going to be in the church and not the world. There's a 9 to 1 chance that if I'm going to be hurt by somebody, I'm much safer hanging out with a bunch of atheists out in the world. Isn't that a sad reality? Sad, right, Jim? Sad. It's not supposed to be that way. Why does it happen? Go look at our sermon series, When Church Hurts. Here's the reason why church hurts. Because Christians don't understand that the Bible is the guidebook, that Jesus is king. And pastors aren't doing a good job of saying, we are not doing this as the body of Christ. Why? Because they're concerned about money and numbers. I'd rather have a church of 20 people who love each other and love Jesus and there's no drama and come together and confess sin to one another. Doesn't that sound nice, Julie? Than a bunch of people who are in division saying, I'm going to gossip and I'm going to slander and I'm going to do what I want and I don't care about hierarchy or authority and to hell with all of it. Well, you're already living in hell. Maybe you need to go somewhere else, hang out with Satan. <laughs> right? I don't want our church to be a church that hurts, and I don't want to take communion in that. What fellowship does God have with the devil? None. Look, elders, officers, and staff, they oversee the business affairs of the church. That's Ephesians 4, 11 through 12. There's a lot of Christians who are like, well, who oversees the actual business? Because I want a piece of that. No, you don't. It's horrible. Matthias and I were just having a conversation. 
he was talking to somebody who was wanting to step up to be an officer or board member of a church. And it's like, oh, really? You want that position of wonderfulness? Let's have eight or nine hour meetings and uh, let's talk about all of these problems known to man. It's horrible. You don't want that unless you're called. You know you're called if you have holy orders. Deacons care for the needs of the church. That's Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. Deacons and deaconesses. Christians serve in the ministries of the church. That's 1 Corinthians 12. If you do not have a ministry to call your own and your home, you're missing what God has called you to. You're missing it. You're called to serve. You're not called to sit. From the moment you're saved, whether you're a teenager or can barely even move because you're almost 100 years old, God has a ministry position for you. This is what a communal church looks like. It's safe. It's under the authority of the king. It's guided by the word. It's protected by pastors, overseen by a group of individuals who are called by holy orders, cared for by deacons, served by the Christians. The church is meant to be a house of peace and unity, never a house of gossip and slander and division and feelings. That's not a house of communion. Look, and let, let me tell you really clearly how you know if a church is ready for communion or not. And maybe some of us were not. I want you to know that I spent about an hour with Jesus today personally because we're talking about communion. I take this seriously, and I ask Jesus, am I good? I'm not good just because I'm the pastor. God, make sure I'm good. Here's how you know if you're good or not. Look, outside of leadership positions, which is really the sacrament or ordinance of holy orders, if you speak about a person rather than to a person, you are divided from God and you should not take communion. That's the standard right there. Make it really simple. If there's a problem in your life, if you think there's a problem in the church, and you're talking to everybody who's not involved rather than the people that maybe are involved, you're not ready for communion. You're divided. Now, some of us, we might say, you know, I, I'm not too worried about that. Can I tell you, you need to be worried about that? Every time you go to the communion table, you need to be worried about that. Remember, at the beginning of the message, even teenagers led by the Holy Spirit were understanding that something needed to happen in order to have communion with God. There was confession. There was an acknowledgment of sin. There was a fear of doing it wrong. Here's why. Because communion can be a health hazard. Churches don't preach this. Did you know communion can be a health hazard? Literally a health hazard. Communion is dangerous. Watch. Paul goes on to say, same chapter, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 27. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, in a way that's divided will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Guilty of what? First, Paul says, let a person examine themselves. Then it's so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who drinks and eats without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of, now listen, that is why many of you are weak. Many of you are ill. Many of you have died. Is that really in the Bible? The Apostle Paul said, when you take the bread, when you take the blood, you'd better make sure that you are preparing yourself for what it means to be in communion with the communal God who is perfect. Because if you come to God in a way that you're harboring gossip and unforgiveness and division in your heart, God might pour out a bowl of wrath on you, not a bowl of blessing. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and even some of you in the church have died. If we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Here's the warning. Seeking communion with the God of forgiveness while unforgiven is like consuming poison. Can you imagine this? 
Here there are Christians all over the world taking communion today. There's Christians who are living in sin, habitual, unrepentant sin, taking communion today. There are Christians who are taking communion today who are actively gossiping and slandering and creating division in their churches all over the world. There's pastors who are allowing people to take communion and are not preaching what the Bible says because of fears that it might impact the dollar or the chairs. Or they just don't know, which is sad in itself as well. And the Bible says that if we as the people of God take communion in a way that is unworthy, there might be a real cost to our health, even to the point of death. This is not something to take lightly. It's not something to mock. So how can we really commune with God? We're getting ready to take communion together. What do we need to do? It's something that we need to know. Let me tell you that if you are at the church today and you are not a Christian and you're just exploring the faith, if you're exploring what we believe, I want Legacy to be known as the church that is safe for atheists and agnostics and people of other religions because if it's not safe for you to learn about Jesus, you won't find him. You are welcome to come and experience what is happening in our church. But don't be mistaken. You can't be a member of the church, of the body of Christ, a part of the bride of Christ. You can't be a member of the church and participate in worship in the same way because you are living without Christ. So if that's you, you are more than welcome to experience Jesus here. And I want more than anything for you to know him. But do not take communion. Because that's not for you until you have eaten of the body of Jesus and drank the blood of Jesus. Don't take communion if you're unsure. And if you need to talk about it, come talk to me. I would love to help you understand where you're at with God. But before you take communion, you need to ask God to reveal your sin. Every single time, God, what is my sin? Not what is somebody else's sin. What is my sin? Then you need to repent of that sin. That's between you and God. Repent of that sin before taking communion. God, will you please forgive me? And sometimes it might take some time. Church, it's not like this. Okay, God, help me to see what my sin is. And then God reveals to you, oh, well, you were a real turd to your family. Okay, Jesus, please forgive me. I'm good to go. That's no, no, no. You need to say, God, help me to repent of sin. And is it right for me to take communion right now? Because it might take some time for you to repent of that sin. You need to seek reconciliation between you and others before taking communion. Remember what the teenagers did. I have never in my 35 years of life in the church, ever, it doesn't mean it hasn't happened, but I haven't ever seen Christians in the church going to one another and saying, you know what, the Lord has revealed to me that I've sinned against you, and I'm sorry. Will you please forgive me? I think that that needs to happen in our church. I don't know what it looks like. But wouldn't that be a beautiful thing if that happened every single week? Can you imagine how much forgiveness would be in the church? Literally, every single week, if people in the church said, hey, you know what? I treated you in this way. Or even, I just was thinking about you in this way, and I need to ask you for forgiveness. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's a unified church, a beautiful church, and a humble church. You got to assess your status of membership by evaluating your commitment, your unity, and division. Are you aligned with the church that God has called you to be at? Or are you grumbling and complaining? Make it right. Do not, under any circumstances, take communion with thoughts or actions of division or unforgiven sin. There's a lot of us that are going to be tempted just to go with the flow and take communion. And that's how you might end up dead. It's not a joke. That's how you end up in the hospital. That's how you end up with incurable illnesses. And then 
Allow the bread of Jesus to remind you of Jesus' physical life that was given for your life. And allow the wine and juice to remind you of Jesus' blood that was shed for your eternal life. That's how we take communion as a church. And I'm convinced, Legacy, that if this is how we take communion, our communion not only with God is going to continually remind us of the hope we have in God in a world that looks rather hopeless right now, but it's also going to strengthen the community of Legacy Church, and we're going to have relationships that we crave and desire every week. You might notice that it just kind of happens that every week while I'm preaching, I see people who I've gotten to spend time with throughout the week, and I start talking about them, and it's because they've blessed me throughout the week. Hopefully I can be a blessing to them too. But it's so much more important than me and you. It's about you and you and the people around you. So let's seek communion with the communal God in a way that God looks at Legacy Church and says, well done. These are my people. They are unified. No division exists in them. And even though we are not perfect and we are all works in progress, our Father in heaven looks down at us and says, good job, sons and daughters. Lord Jesus, as we get ready to take communion, and God, not just today, but Lord, every day we take communion as Legacy Church. Lord, I ask that you would purify us and you would allow us to go through these steps of seeking forgiveness from sin, God, from you and from one another. God, I pray that we would be aligned to the body of Christ, that no division would exist in us. Jesus, I pray that we would put truth before feelings, God. And Lord, that we would look for your feelings before our own feelings. Jesus, I ask that the communion of our church would be received as worship, Lord. Something that makes you smile, not something that becomes like poison to us as individuals in our church. We love you, Jesus. Please let us remember your body that was broken for us. And the blood that was shed that we might know you in this life and in the eternal life to come. It is in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.